Hey Janet, welcome back. It's good to see you in the study. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're doing better. Welcome everybody to the Hope City. Yes, uh, keep trying, Janet. <laughs> We're going to get there. We're all going to get there. Um, uh, welcome everybody to the Hope City Church Bible Study. Um, this week's topic, um, it's something, it's a question that I thought about, um, for a while, ever since, um, yeah, God is good, Janet, that's right, <laughs> always keep that faith. Um, it's a question that I thought about, um, for a while, ever since I got saved, and the question is, what is the greatest evidence for the existence of God. And I know too, um, individually, it's our personal uh, experience that has been um, our greatest evidence for the existence of God, the love that you've experienced. And um, I wanna make, take more of the question on when you're engaging in public interactions, um, things of that nature, because they tend to have a, um, a habit of throwing a question mark on your testimony on your experiences and um they're kind of making they kind of make them invalid uh when they discuss things with you because it's not their experience so um that poses the question what is the greatest evidence for the existence of god and um i've had a few um encounters with uh agnostics skeptics atheists one one instance in high school um, I think it was, it was not too long after I got saved and I, I didn't know anything, but that God was real and that he had entered my life. And, um, I knew this guy was a, was an atheist. And so I approached him about it. He didn't know me. I didn't know him, but, um, I had heard that he was an atheist and I just asked him, I said, why are you an atheist? Um, the first encounter with this guy he said, because religion is BS and it's just a clutch, uh, a crutch for people to use to do things. And then, um, <laughs> of course, I was a young Christian. I didn't, I didn't know what to say. I didn't um, really know what, I didn't even really know what a testimony was, even though I had one in my back pocket, which was my own. And um, on the second occasion, um, this is all during, um, I think it was during lunchtime on the campus in high school. And um, I saw him waiting in line and I couldn't be silent about it. Um, I just thought of that verse, you deny me before man, I will deny you before the father. So I went up to him again, not knowing really um, what I was going to say if he had objections to my faith. But I just, um, I asked him again, oh, why don't you believe in God? Why are you uh, an atheist? Um and then he, he, he told me to, to uh, F off. Excuse me for being prude. He told me to F off, basically. Uh, that's what he said. And then continued on a rant and then uh, walked away. And um, I was a work in progress. I had to, you know. <laughs> but um, strangely enough, because I was saved, it, it wasn't... A moment of instant reaction or instant uh, emotional anger uh, it was more of hurt and when we talk about I hurt because I lost something but then when we talk about God hurting he hurts because you have lost something and, you know God being the infinite and great I am the self-existent one he um, he doesn't need his creation but also much does he want it and how he displayed that desire for us on that cross so um, you'll find that when you study or um, examine or look or listen to the, you say, the mainstream atheists, agnostics, and skeptics, they, um, they're, some of them are former Christians or former Muslims or former um, Judea, uh, Jews uh, of the Judea, Judaic religion, uh, <laughs> Judaism, of Judaism. I couldn't say that for a second. Former Christians, Muslims, Jews, um, who have left their faith for um, reasons that sometimes they don't expound upon. But I think an important shifting point in a person's walk with God, whomever they serve at that time. Hey, Jose, 
welcome. Um, a real shifting point, a real turning point in, uh, is just seeing how you handle tribulation, seeing how you um, deal with the problems of sin in your life. And many of us fall to that. Many of us don't get back up. Many of us um, remain in the web of sin. And um, I know Dr. Frank Turk was asked in an interview one time, asked, he was asked, what's the number one thing that keeps teens from becoming Christians? And he said, sex. Because uh, he, uh, he gave an example of a, of, a, of a young man that came up to him after a conference. And he said to him that, um, Frank, I just can't live up to the standards, uh, up to the Christian standard and the principles and the, the morality that is set upon one and the moral responsibility that is set upon one because I'm prohibited from doing certain things in this body. We all are. Um, Christian, any pretty much uh, any worldview except Buddhism or spiritualism and a few others. Um, basically, the three major worldviews or major world faiths, Judaism, Christian, Christianity, and uh, Islam, those three, uh, they're the monotheistic religions, they have a moral standard. Um, I don't understand how atheists can have a moral standard, given that there's nothing to, there's no higher power, there's no higher authority, there's no uh, justification for such morality. But um, we'll see. I want to read some of verses from Romans that um, kind of, usher my point on evidence for God. So I'm going to turn to Romans chapter 1, and I'm going to start with verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. So they're not hidden. We don't know everything about the world and about the universe. But there are a lot. I'm talking about a lot of things that are clearly seen that are of him being understood of the world, uh, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So even his, so his power and his Godhead are understood from the things clearly seen in the world, from creation, so that they are without excuse. Who's the they? We kind of dropped in uh, in the middle of context here, but the they are the, if you go back, and to the beginning verses of chapter 1, you'll see who he's discussing, the um, the lawless ones, the um, the forsakers of God, the, um, the adulterers, the idolaters, all these people, basically those who don't believe, those who uh, are living in the sin of the flesh body, they are without excuse. They cannot say that they didn't see or know the power of God because they're clearly seen is what Paul is saying. And um, that word new there, I want to point out that word new. Oh, actually, let me read verse 21 first. Because, verse 21, that because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. So when they knew him as God, that word knew there, it means uh, experience, acquainted with, perceived. They didn't glorify him as God and weren't thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. It became vain in their imaginations. And so the worship of the hawk and the birds by the Egyptians and many other things. Um, the worship of the serpent. The serpent, uh, the worship of a serpent is prevalent in all uh, pagan religions. And every heathenistic pantheon. Pantheon, I mean. Um, one example of knew him but didn't glorify him as God is uh, there's a skeptical scholar, Bart Ehrman. He's one of the leading New Testament scholars um, who was a former Christian. He actually went to the same college as uh, one of the leading defenders of the Christian faith, Dr. William Craig. They went to the same college. They had similar experiences. However, Bart Ehrman's experience diverged from William Craig's because William Craig's faith was strengthened um, when he went to college. But Bar Ehrman's was crumbling as he looked into 
what he thought were the hopeless contradictions in the gospel accounts. And he spent the re he's spending the rest of his life um, attempting to expose the hopelessly contradictory gospel accounts. And um, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was Pastor Jose and I who were talking. And um, I, he said, college will either make or break your faith. And I found that to be very true. Um, uh, I've had so many people um, who've had experiences in their college life that caused them to leave their faith. And part of it, um, many spiritualists and Buddhists were former Christians. But the thing about Buddhism and spirituality, different subject, um, they don't have objective moral standards. So you escape moral responsibility when you partake and um, when you partake and when you what's the word I'm looking for and when you involve and invest yourself my gosh I had a brain fart just now when you involve in, and invest yourself in those world views you no longer have moral responsibility they don't have moral responsibility they just have like inner peace the eternal now stuff like that so um many people and if you ask um someone a buddhist or a spiritualist why did you leave christianity or why did you leave islam or why did you leave judaism it's simply because they probably didn't they probably started doing something that uh god wouldn't approve of and they didn't want to stop so um i had a, also had a sociology teacher and um, I just had to put this in my notes. <laughs> I tell all the stories about my sociology class. I mean, it's in sociology classes in college, just fantastic for the Christian. <laughs> um, he would often bring up Bible verses, um, bring up things about the Christian faith that he thought were repulsive or just things that were, that he'd pull out of context and stuff. And, um, one time he mentioned that he had left his faith long ago but his youth pastor that he used to have his youth pastor told his congregation that he woke up every morning and questioned his faith and my sociology professor said i'm not religious at all but i thought that to be very inspiring here's what here's what that looks like one day and one night you're preaching the word of god and you're hammering at home for the kingdom and you're bringing souls to the altar and you see the miraculous healing you see the miraculous power the miraculous um presence and existence of the living god and you say god i love you so much thank you for everything you've given me thank you for all the blessings you pray to him you praise him and then the next morning you're like god do you really exist hmm. do you really exist the question that makes absolutely no sense at all it is not inspiring at all and it's actually anti-gospel to wake up and knowing better you can read about this in second peter 2 knowing better and still returning to your vain ways that is very very dangerous actually let me go to the verse i didn't plan on going here but i'm gonna do it anyway Second Peter Is it Second Peter? Oh, I'm in First John. I'm an idiot. Yes, I read my Bible. Sorry. Okay, here we go. Second Peter chapter two, starting with verse twenty. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world means being saved for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the lord and savior jesus christ they are again entangled therein entangled with the pollutions of the world and overcome the latter end is worse with them than the beginning so the end in which they get entangled after they've been saved 
is worse than when they were entangled before they were saved. Let's go to verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So it was better for them to not know and to not believe and be righteous than for them to know righteousness and still reject the holy commandment given to them. Verse 22, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So um, that's the point I'm wanting to make there that uh, people who have indulged once again in the sin of the world uh, once again in the sin of the flesh and the desires of the flesh having left the Christian faith of course we love um, people regardless of what they have done no question about it when we're discussing um, uh, yeah, I'm on the right page. when we're discussing reasons why people leave uh, reasons why uh, people reject God it's got to be what you have to throw in there is because moral responsibility i mean you can you're your own god in that worldview <laughs> and talking about leaving because of sin it confirms that one saying you can't walk with god holding hands with the devil your lifestyle can't disagree with this word and if this word says one thing you change you don't change this, you change and let the word of God speak for itself. So let's go to verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise. It's like Paul wrote this for our day today. You'll find most, if not all of the leading atheists and skeptics out in universities, out on college campuses um, as professors attempting to distort throw a question mark on the christian faith especially the christian faith i mean i don't know what it is it's just they have a tendency to they have a they're like a our christian faith is like a target a bullseye for them to attempt to destroy i've seen it happen with other worldviews but not nearly as much as i've seen it with the christian worldview and so professing themselves to be wise the claim to be wise in their idolatrous, um, wicked, lawless, and perverted ways, they became fools, was what Paul says. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. 23. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Man is God in this culture in this generation and into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things we may not have um, people today going out and building huge um, statues of birds and um, we probably still do I don't know <laughs> but we do have people worshiping themselves and answering to themselves and only providing justification of themselves, putting themselves on a pedestal, that they dictate what they can do and what their right and wrong is. And so um, history is, there's scores, I mean, talk about scores, uh, where Israel dwelt all around them was pagan worship and um, the imagining of that a bird or there's a God of the water, there's a God of the fields, there's a God of um, this controller, there's a God of um, love, there's a God of this and God of that. And it's vain in imaginations. And they became fools because of it. It's, it's not just animals. It's, it's mankind. And that was how it was ever since the beginning when Adam and Eve attempted to become God, or when even before that, when Satan attempted to become God. It's not a new thing. It's become more prevalent, but it's not a new thing. 
So, um, being your own God, that's dangerous because you actually believe you are. You have no moral accountability. You have no uh, moral responsibility. And when people ask me, um, why are you shoving your morality onto me? And I'm like, this is not my rules. These aren't my rules that I'm not making up. I mean, that I'm making up. I didn't make this up. These are not, this is not my morality. This is not my rules. I'm attesting and accounting for what the true living God is saying about morality and about rules and about law and commandment. So this is not ours. Christians didn't, do not have their own morality. It's God's. So whether the, um, so talking about um, the invisible things of him that, uh, that are clearly seen from the beginning of the world, um, I, I honestly don't understand. Um, I mean, I, I can understand what they're saying and uh, the reasons that they give, but I can't comprehend why they think it's wise uh, for an atheist to believe that there's no God and whether the creator of the universe is the God of Christianity or not is a separate study. Um, but it pose, it does pose the question of what is the greatest evidence of God? If you're, this is what um, people might ask you, if you're telling me about all this and you're telling me I'm not living um, the right way, the way I should be and that there's a better way, there's love, there's peace and happiness and mercy, with this guy Jesus and uh, there's a God that has loved you since eternity past um, what what evidence do you have for this God I've been approached with this and um, they might present to you the Big Bang Theory many of you have probably heard of it many Christians are afraid of the Big Bang I'm not afraid of the Big Bang I believe in the Big Bang I just know who banged it when you talk about the Big Bang, it's sci it's a, um, the scientist's interpretation, I guess you could say, of the beginning of the universe. So it is interpreted and it goes as the universe began as a small, tiny dot, a very small, tiny, tiny dot, almost to the point of nothing. And boom, uh, a Big Bang happened. And thus we have a universe. And in the, tr in the trillion of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second that small dot burst and exploded into what we have as the universe and what we see it as is Genesis chapter 1 let there be light boom and there was light so what is the greatest evidence for the existence of God and um, this is it's debatable but um, this is my opinion on the greatest evidence that there is indeed a creator and a designer to this universe. Um, I think back in the 1900s or before the 1900s, before the, uh, before the 20th century, uh, the prevailing view among astronomers, um, philosophers, and scientists was that the universe was eternal and uh, didn't have a beginning, that it was infinite in the past and had no initial uh, instant of creation that the universe always existed and therefore it was absolutely unnecessary and absolutely um, arbitrary to posit someone created it because you can't create it if it was eternal in the past but that that worldview <laughs> that worldview just collapsed and crumpled under, under the discovery of Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity in the 1900s. And what Einstein's theory predicted is that the universe was either in a cosmic expansion or, or a constant collapse, a, cos a constant shrinking, you could say. And um, after this, theory, this, general, this general theory of relativity, which included things like gravity and such and such forth, when it started to be applied in institutions, such as the one who discovered the equation that would solve Einstein's theory, uh, Dr. Edwin Hubble, who worked at Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena, California. I think it was about the mid 1900s, somewhere around there. Um, he began to measure, uh, what it, this was purely theoristic. Einstein's theory was purely the theoristic. It was not um, <laughs> meant to explain universe created or universe infinite but when edwin hubble and people started applying this theory 
Edwin Hubble started to measure the red shifts of distant galaxies and uh, the relative distance between them. And when he plotted them, and uh, when he plotted them against the relative distance, he found that the distance between them increased and increased as a linear function to their galaxies. And I'll put it in English. That is the discovery of the expanding universe. So now that that discovery, that remarkable and incredible discovery has been made, the prevailing view of contemporary scientists and um, astronomers and philosophers, um, biologists, things like that, the prevailing view among them is that the universe was not eternal, but indeed, but did indeed have a beginning in the finite past. And what it confirmed is that if it's constantly expanding, then at one point in the past, it had to be a small, very small dot. Big Bang. Genesis chapter 1. So the discovery of the expansion of the universe is evidence for our God. Because either if it was shrinking or if it was expanding, neither of these can be extrapolated past infinity. They had to have a, a, a start, a start uh, an initial condition. Indeed, time, space, and matter all had an instant beginning in this um, cosmic expansion. And at one point, a small dot. And so what Paul shows here and what my point has been is that the people all around us are going to object to the existence of God, object to um, the Christian God, the Christian worldview, the Christian morality. Uh, but if we can posit reasonably and very plausibly the existence of a higher, powerful, and a more authoritative and... Um, you could say all ruling creator and whether that's the Christian God, the Islamic God, um, the God of the Egyptians, whichever one, it, whichever one it is, that's a whole different study. But positing a creator and a designer to the universe is the first step in um, witnessing. If you witness in such a way, um, Second Peter two, uh, Second Peter 3.15 in terms of evidence for the existence of God. That is a number one and a very compelling way and, a, and has compelled so many. Um, C.S. Lewis was once an atheist, compelled so many people to come to believe that there was a designer and there was a creator um, showing that the universe is not infinite, but indeed had a, um, a start in the finite past. And what could start it other than a very powerful mind, a very powerful being, um, and very intelligent and arguments could be made for a very personal being when you see the design of the universe and the seasons being selected as they are being set forth and appointed as they are that's what season means literally appointed times when you see all these things and they're clearly seen as Paul says when you see all these things you absolutely cannot profess to be wise and say that there is no God I mean, just to give you an example, Dr. Lawrence Krauss, who's uh, probably going to win a Nobel Prize soon, um, one of the leading physicists of our day. This is a direct quote from him. Nothing is a physical quantity. Let me repeat that. Nothing is a physical quantity. So what he's saying is nothing is something. I'm just, I'm like, no, my gosh, you cannot explain nothing by being something and something being nothing. I guess on the 4th of July or something, he's saying that all those fireworks, there's nothing. There's nothing causing them. That's what atheists are saying. That all the fireworks we hear, um, if there's an explosion somewhere distant, nothing happened. Nothing caused it. I mean, if even if, if you're in the woods and you see a painting on a tree... Even if you never see the painter, you ne there's no footprints, there's no it's just a painting on a tree. If you never see a painter, if you never see the painter, and you never see who did it, you still determine that someone did it. I mean, they're trying to create all these um, 
intelligent lives, um, scientists and laboratory, they're trying to create life. But what they're doing is showing that it requires intelligence to create life. Nothing is not a physical quantity. Nothing is nothing. Out of nothing comes nothing. Just as the, um, the cosmological argument goes, if the universe had a beginning and everything that is created had a cause, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause, namely a designer, a creator. And as I said, who that creator is, we better find out. And if it's the Christian God, um, that can be shown very, very clearly. So um, science, biology, cosmology, and history especially, I think, display the creator. Display, um, I argue that it displays the God of the Bible, as all of us uh, believe. Um, hold on, I saw a comment here. Oh, Angela, there is no middle ground and no writing on the fence. I am learning as I experience life in this diverse world, how the evidence somehow seems to be relevant to one another. I admire your knowledge. Thank you. Oh, it's not my knowledge. Well, thank you, but um, it's not my knowledge. I mean, Proverbs chapter three, all the knowledge comes from him. And I mean, when I, I felt the same way too, when I started studying this, my mind was just absolutely, it was blown, I was blown away because the things historians and archaeologists and scientists and astronomers are discovering, they're discovering evidences for my God. So keep on discovery, keep on researching because you're discovering evidences from my God. Will we in the future have an open, have an in-person Bible study? Um, I'm not sure about that. I'm not so sure. That would be, have to, that would, um, have to ask pastor Jose about that I have thought about it um but it's just it's a it's a question in the air as of now and um it's a possibility I'm not going to say absolutely not um it's just something we'd have to discuss um so yeah that's it <laughs> okay so greatest evidence for God, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, that the universe was not eternal, but had a beginning in the finite past. Clear evidence of someone who designed and created the world. Can't wrap my mind around this, some of this stuff. Yeah. Uh, sometimes if you, if you have any questions, uh, you can of course message me on Facebook, but some of the things, like I said in the, in the, uh, earlier in the study, we can't understand the full being of the Godhead or the full being of um, his creation. I mean, we haven't even reached the bottom of the ocean, for crying out loud. Um, but nevertheless, um, as I said in, in church one time, you can comprehend that there's an ocean in front of you, though you may not be able to understand or even fit everything that's in it inside your head. You can understand and know that it, it exists, but you may even though you may not be able to comprehend everything in it. And same thing with God. You can know that he exists, though you may not be able to understand everything about him or everything that he does. I mean, um, as I also said before, if an infinite God can fit into my tiny three pound brain, I don't think he's worth all that worshiping. <laughs> I think it's, um, it's good that some things are left to him and that we trust him. And that's where our righteousness is accounted, that we trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, if there is no questions, that's where I will end the study there. And I'd like to pray for um, all those who are sick and uh, for understanding, because um, hopefully everybody comprehended what I was saying there. I know that sometimes when you get into questions of scientists, of science and uh, astronomy, the the wording can be a little funky there, even for me. <laughs> um, on that note, let's uh, let's pray out our study, as we always do. Dear Heavenly Father, um, what a glorious honor and privilege to share your wisdom with everybody. Um, I can't explain the gratitude and the, just the, the close 
um, intimacy I feel with you when I do things like this and when I witness to people about your existence and about your son. And I hope as we all do such things, sharing your name and uh, presenting the gospel to people, that we feel a close and intimate um, presence of you, that you're there to protect us and keep us safe and keep us from any harm that may uh, be bestowed upon us. And um, Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone who's sick. Um, I pray for a speedy recovery and um, a fast healing and just one touch, if it be in your will, God. Just one touch, let your will be done. And um, we pray for that healing for Jose and Janet, Virginia, pastor's family, uh, my family, and uh, all families in the church. We thank you, God, for this study. We thank you for everything you've done for us. And um, just thank you for the design you've given. I mean, I could go on and on in this prayer, but I'm going to stop there. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you all for watching. Um, I'll be here next Wednesday. So be sure to uh, be in, in this study at 7 p.m. next Wednesday. So thank you all for watching.